We're here to do two things. First of all, to present the James Black Medal uh, to Professor Andrew Whiten and to listen to his lecture on the cultures of apes and other animals. Uh, this is the Sir James Black Senior Prize. Uh, I'm sure you all know that James Black was a distinguished scientist, Nobel Prize winner, and almost everything else. And this prize is awarded to Professor Whiten for his outstanding contribution to making Scotland foremost in the UK in the study of primates and to our understanding of the importance of this second inheritance system in biology and the role it plays in concert with genetic inheritance and individual learning. We will hear his um, lecture in just a few moments, but now I would like to ask him to come up onto the stage so that I can present him on behalf of the society with this rather beautiful medal. Andy, congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, Jenny. I'm now going to leave the stage to you for as long as you need, and then we'll both be up here for a, a question and answer session for about maybe 20 minutes or so after Professor Whiten has given us his lecture. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> Well, um, thank you, Alan. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the Royal Society of Edinburgh very much uh, for, for awarding me this prize and medal. Um, and particularly, I think, for all the people who have to work to make something like this happen. That's to say, there are referees who write, there are committees who have to deliberate, and I'm very grateful to them for all the work that goes into this. It means a lot to me, so thank you. And thank you to all of you for coming uh, on what's really quite a nice evening uh, in Edinburgh. So here's what I'm going to talk about, the cultures of apes and other animals. And I should start by saying what I mean by culture. Well, um, if you buy a Sunday Times, you get a, a load of supplements. And one of them is called culture. So what's in that? Um, well, the answer is you can see on the, pic on, the, on the picture probably here, this is about a pop festival and there's other stuff in there about the theatre, the cinema, the arts generally, maybe even ballet and opera. Well, we would call that high culture perhaps, a, a particular aspect of culture. But the culture that I'm going to talk about is much broader and when anthropologists talk about culture, um, they include a lot of uh, really quite mundane uh, material. And the same is true of biologists and psychologists. What we're talking about is really everything that you learn from others through a process of social learning that endures for long enough to be called a tradition. And all the traditions really add up to what we mean by culture. So it's a very broad concept. And in humans, it leads to all kinds of different behavior across the world. There are different cultures uh, around the world. And so cultures include uh, what people wear, the kind of uh, rituals they become involved in, like this procession over here. And as I say, such mundane things as, well, what we eat uh, in our particular culture, the way we eat it. Do we use chopsticks? Do we use knife and fork? Um, the way we speak, the way we communicate, um, perhaps our oral and our written language. And then the man up there with the bow and arrow is just illustrating one little example of material culture. All the material around us, pretty much everything you see in here, is part of our culture, uh, including all the, the digital projection and so on. And so we are really the ultimate uh, cultural creatures. These two little characters in the middle here are picking up a little bit of uh, culture at an early stage, realizing this is what you do with something like that. They haven't quite got it right yet, but at least the character on the right uh, will expect one day will. Maybe they'll read a book, or maybe they'll even write a book. What about the character on the left, which is a kind of general purpose primate, actually. The astute amongst you will see it's, it's rather hybrid. It's got an ape's face, but it's got a tail, uh, which apes don't have, monkeys do. So it serves that purpose uh, for us. And the question is often asked, if we're talking about chimpanzees, then, well, do chimpanzees have culture in the broad sense? I've defined it. Um, that could apply to any animal. Does species X have culture? Do rats have culture? 
Do crocodiles, do bees have something we might call culture in the way I've defined it? Well, I think that question is just actually too simplistic for any real serious scientific investigation. And what I've been doing over the last few years is saying that question, answer with a yes or no, won't do. We've really got to set that aside. Um, and I've dissected culture into a number of different dimensions, three main categories or aspects of culture. In all cases, what I'm referring to are traditions. So a tradition is already a behavior that's socially learned and spread across a group, perhaps even across several groups, to endure. Here's a, a familiar example at the top from humans, a procession, a particular tradition locally somewhere. Um, but the little bird at the bottom is a chaffinch, and it's singing. And it's been shown that chaffinches in different uh, regions sing in a different way. They have different dialects, and we know that that's socially learned. So that counts as a tradition as well. And my three main aspects of culture are, first of all, the population level patterning of traditions like this, because we might find, as we compare different species, that these, these two very different examples here actually do show some similarities in the way they're distributed across space or the way they change over time. Second, we can look at the cultural contents, that to say the actual kind of behavior that make these up. And obviously, these are quite different. Here we've got human procession. We've got the dialect uh, in, in bird song. We can also ask about the mechanisms by which these are transmitted. So in terms of cultural contents, when we compare ourselves with some species, um, we can find there are some similarities. For example, in relation to our closest relative, the chimpanzee, they have really complex, uh, extensive technology. They use tools in various ways, as do we. So there, at that level of analysis, is a similarity. And of course, then there are differences. You can see a difference illustrated here. We go in for paintbrushes, which they don't. They use another kind of brush to, to do something else we'll come to. And then, as I said, there's transmission mechanisms, how are behaviors like these passed on, whether amongst humans or chimpanzees or other animals. Um, so here we're talking about things like imitation or teaching. We can compare different species on that dimension as well. And in my analyses, this becomes much more complex uh, as well. So each of those is divided into various subcategories that we've investigated, all shown in, in the human case in a full way. And then we can say, well, we can compare chimpanzees and ask, well, how, do, how does their behavior or their cultural transmission compare? I'm not going to go into all of these details tonight, um, but I'm going to focus initially on the spatiotemporal patterning and look at our closest relative, chimpanzees. It's amazing when you think just 50 years ago, we knew next to nothing about our closest living relative. Now we know an enormous amount, first through the research of, of Jane Goodall and then Japanese teams. And over the last 50 years, information has built up. So it began to be apparent um, 10 or 20 years ago, really, that uh, chimpanzees did behave in different ways across Africa, as people do. And I was privileged to be the first author of this paper that appeared, appeared in Nature uh, in 1999 called Chimpanzee Cultures. Um, I did this by uh, enlisting the support of all these co-authors who were the leaders of the long-term research study sites. And what we did was to collate all the information that had started to accumulate over decades of research. In fact, altogether, we counted 151 years of research across the, the long-term study sites. Um, and this was what we called a two-phase study. So in the first phase, we simply went to those research groups and said, OK, from all you know, what do you think might be a cultural variation? Something that's very common at your site, and you've heard, well, it doesn't happen anywhere else without any apparent explanation. Or the other way around, you've heard some things very common elsewhere. And in 20 or 30 years at this, your site, you've still never seen it. And that gave us 65 candidate cultural variants. Then we defined all those, and then we gave that list back to each research group and said, OK, now code or classify each of those for your site. Is it really common, what we would call uh, customary, where pretty much everybody does it, um, or at least habitual? That's done by several individuals repeatedly, so it's consistent with being spread by, by this process of social learning. Or at the other extreme, of course, is it absent? And there, of course, it's, it's important to know, well, is that with some ecological explanation or without an ecological explanation. With an ecological explanation, it's not particularly interesting. If you saw something like the top right example here, we have chimpanzees um, 
uh, cracking nuts using natural hammers, we find that doesn't happen somewhere where there aren't any nuts. Well, that's not very interesting. But if all the raw materials are there, then this becomes interesting because it's happening in one place and not at another without any apparent uh, easy explanation. So having gone through this process, we then isolated from these 65, 39 behaviors that met our criteria for a tradition or a cultural variation because they were very common at one site at least and absent at at least one other site without any apparent environmental or genetic explanation. And these panels over here, the six panels for these long-term study sites, uh, it's all the same panel of potential behavior patterns, um, but they're lit up if they're common at the site, they're just grayed out if they're not, there are a few no entry signs, but that's where there's something like, there's no nuts, so there couldn't be nut cracking, for example. Um, and we isolated 39 of these. And this was quite a revelation because up to then we knew about some traditions in some animals, but they were typically just like one, so like the chaffinch dialect I referred to here. Here we suddenly got a very rich picture of chimpanzee traditions, which we could call culture. You can't read what's uh, in there, probably even now people at the back can't read uh, those, just describing what some of these behaviors are. But the point about them is that they cover a whole range of behaviors. The way you process food, the way you tear it and, 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 and get into what you want to inside. Many different kinds of tool use, both for foraging, but also other things like for comfort. Um, social behavior, even grooming techniques. So one little example I'll give you at this point is um, if you're a chimpanzee and you're grooming your, your mate over here, you get an ectoparasite off. How do you dispatch it? Well, over in West Africa, you put it on the forearm and you squash it, and that's it, and off, off it goes. But in East Africa, the Gombe stream, for example, no, you pick a leaf, and you will carefully put the thing on the leaf and inspect it and decide whether it's worth eating, or no, it's disgusting, throw it away. So they all lose leaves to do that, um, and that doesn't happen in West Africa. Just one little example, and, and even courtship um, gambits. So I don't have time to tell you many examples, but I'm just going to start with one. It's the one shown top left here. It's called pestle pounding. Um, and it just occurs at Bosu in, in West Africa. And in this, a chimpanzee climbs to the top of a palm tree, quite a sort of elaborate thing to do, takes one of the fronds that someone before has left there, and having got what it can of the nutritious growing point, the, the big bud of, uh, of the palm tree, um, it has to go in deeper, and it uses this uh, palm to pound down into the palm. And that's what you're going to see here. It only happens at this one place, but pretty much everybody does it. That's to say, all the chimpanzees do it. So you get a little cartoon here showing what it's like, and then we're going to get a video clip. Bending down to see what he's getting, and then... Extraordinary behavior, vig vigorous behavior, um, and as I say, everybody does it here, but elsewhere, no one's worked it out, as well. no, one, no one is doing that. So that's it, just this, this one site. If we go back to our map of Africa, so uh, that's uh, what's happening at Bosu there, but over a larger area here, we find another very interesting behavior, which is using those natural hammers to, to crack nuts, wood or stone. Let's look at a couple of examples of those because we don't see those in, in East Africa. So I think just a, a few examples here. The wooden uh, hammer at the top, they're doing it in a tree, which is, which is quite tricky. If it's a very hard nut using a stone, and here's just how it can be frustrating uh, trying to do it in a tree. Probably don't do that. Um, and in fact, chimpanzees may take eight, nine, or 10 years to perfect doing this. It's not just a question of lifting up a great rock like that and going crash, because then you just have powder. What you need is to just crack the shell and then be able to get the nut out. So it can take eight, nine, or even ten years to really perfect that uh, technique. Um, so, okay, so that's just happening over in, in West Africa. Um, and what we want to do is say, well, can we really attribute that to, to, to culture, to social learning, by excluding environmental or, or genetic explanations? Well, we think the environmental one we can because it's found that elsewhere people have gone and checked, scientists have gone very carefully checked, that there are the raw materials there. In fact, even in West Africa, over, over here, there's a very large river, the Sassandra and Co River, and on the other, one side of it, the chimpanzee's doing this, and just on the other side, no. Uh, and people, scientists have gone there and checked. You know, there are the nuts, there are all the raw materials, they just haven't, as it worked it out, it hasn't got 
there. What about the genetic explanation, though? You know, maybe this is kind of like an instinct of West African chimpanzees, and the East African ones have just not, never evolved that instinct. But we check that's not the case, because we've been to East Africa, and we've done experiments there, behavioral experiments, with chimpanzees who are on an island sanctuary. They're victims of the bushmeat trade, often orphaned by the bushmeat trade. They're reared on a sanctuary on a large island, Ngambra Island, in uh, Lake Victoria, um, in uh, Uganda. And what we did was we had one chimpanzee over here, like the one on the right, Marwa, who was trained to actually do this behavior, which none of the chimpanzees there in the wild do. And then we had young ones like this uh, little guy over here who could watch. And the question was, would they learn it? And the simple answer was, yes, they all did. So by observation, they could learn it. It means that <clears throat> this isn't just an instinct in West African chimpanzees. It's something that any chimpanzee can and will learn socially. But what I want to do is just show you this, uh, clip this uh, video in a moment and show you a video clip because uh, I think it shows us something else. And this starts to delve into one of those other attributes or aspects of social learning, the mechanisms by which this is being acquired. Um, and I always introduce this clip by uh, saying something about my, fa my father-in-law. I have to be careful what I say now because my wife's in the audience here. But uh, she'll agree, I think, he used to love watching boxing matches on the TV. And when he was watching that boxing match, he would be watching and really engaging with it. And then he, he'd start doing this kind of thing, uh, which I think we as a cultural species do. We, we identify with that other individual. And somehow inside our brains, uh, there's a model of what's going on, a motoric model, so that that behavior then sometimes even kind of spills out. Most of the time, that is going on in our head, it, it seems. We now know from neurophysiology, but it's inhibited. The output is inhibited. But sometimes it spills over. And that's what you're going to see in this little chap here on the left. So this is just a brief clip. Mao knows how to do it. But you can see Baluku is just engaging with that, identifying with what it is. And I think that's one of the, the hallmarks of a cultural species. We don't see much of that, uh, in, in fact, in, in other animals. Um, OK, so those are just uh, a few examples um, of all these 39 variants that we identified. And over the years since, there have been more uh, added. But I think there are two uh, general conclusions uh, from all of this research so far. One is that um, there are multiple and very diverse traditions uh, in our closest living relative here. And so we might infer that that was some kind of propensity that was there in our common ancestor, five or six million years ago, not necessarily all these behaviors, but the general disposition. But then the second thing, which I've not really mentioned so far, is that if you look at each of these panels and think of them as like a patchwork quilt, I hope you can probably just see, looking at them, each one is different. Those are the communities with what I've called unique arrays of traditions. In fact, if I watch a chimpanzee for long enough and I probably tick off just three or four of the behavior patterns that are shown there, I can tell you where that chimpanzee comes from in the same way as you could for a human. You see they're using chopsticks, they're dressing in a certain way, talking in a certain way. They come, probably come from a certain part of, of Asia because that's, that's the culture that belongs there. So those are some of our main uh, conclusions. But there's still that nagging doubt. I, I said we needed to exclude the genetic and environmental explanations, and that's perhaps about the best approach we have in, in the wild. What we'd really like to do as scientists, of course, is do a behavioral experiment where we perhaps translocated a chimpanzee. We took a chimpanzee who does that, that um, pestle pounding and parachute them into East Africa, as it were, and see, well, then does the behavior spread? But for pragmatic and, and really ethical reasons, we can't move chimpanzees in that way. They would often be uh, killed if, if we did that kind of experiment. But what we have done a lot of is with captive chimpanzees, like in zoos or in big uh, primate centers, to do the kind of experiments that are needed to really uh, check out that chimpanzees have this capacity. Here was our first attempt to do so, in um, which we had two groups of chimpanzees who can't see each other. That's all these circles. And in each of these, we just separated one chimpanzee. Um, and they were presented with a problem. And I've actually brought it along here. And if you go to Edinburgh Zoo and look at our, some of our centers there, you'll actually see one of these and be able to have a go with it uh, yourself. 
Um, so what this is is something that chimpanzees, all the chimpanzees in both groups are presented with. It's the same problem. And inside here is, is a piece of food, a grape. So it's like they get in the wild. There's a food they would really like, but they can't get at it because there's some mesh here. But with a tool, they can. So what we do is take one chimpanzee aside. Um, let's start with the one over the other side there. Um, and No, let's start this side and uh, show it there's a way to solve this. With your stick, you can raise this blockage up out the way. And if I'm careful to catch it, I'll get my grape, I hope. So that's the way to do it. So we let that chimpanzee become an expert in that technique. But over in the other group, same problem, but we show there's a very different way to do it. There's a little hatch here at, at the front. And if I stick my stick in there, I can push the blockage back. It goes against the grain for a chimpanzee to push food away from them there. Uh, but they learn to do that, and there it is again. So now we've got an expert in the other group who knows uh, a different technique. And what we do is reunite uh, the chimpanzee expert with her fellows. We had a, a, a high-ranking female we chose to do this. And so others can come and watch. Um, both my daughters are artists, by the way, so it, it, it's, um, it's very convenient often that I can get them to do a lovely little uh, illustration like this. So the others can watch. Um, and the question is, of course, do these behaviors spread differentially in the two groups? Well, to anticipate the results, I'll actually show you a graph uh, shortly. Yes, they do. They spread differentially. But having introduced the idea, I just want to leap uh, onto one further question is, well, could such tradition spread not only within the group, but from group to group? After all, that's what they'd have to do in the wild if our interpretation of what we're seeing in the wild is right. So this we did at another chimpanzee center where, <clears throat> fortunately, there are three groups of chimpanzees here who can see each other through big windows along the side. You can perhaps see them in this, this photograph. And then here there are three other groups who can also see their neighbors, but they can't see the other triplet of groups. And again, we have one problem, we, we, we set them, but there are two different ways to solve it. So you can open up a hatch here uh, at the top and put a stick in and stab these things and pull them out, dates or, or grapes. Here you can instead uh, raise uh, a, a hatch and use a different kind of tool to push them out. So what we do is we put the device here and we show one chimpanzee here one way to do it, like the stab technique. We have the other one right over here. And we show it's the same problem, remember, but we show there's another way to do it, which is the slide technique. And then we reunite all the chimpanzees with that expert. And we say, we, we, we log, <coughs> does the behavior spread a, across the group? Or at least can they solve it? And when half of them are doing it, we can move it to here where the next group can watch. And then we can move it here where uh, these can have a go. Then we move it here so they can watch what this group does. And finally, we can move it here and see what will this group do though, given what we seeded over here, and same for this one, but of course, we seeded the other alternative. So here's a graph I'll just run. We start with the one model who knows how to do it, either by stabbing or by sliding. What happens in the first group? Yes, it spreads. St statistically significantly different, uh, quite striking, in fact, although you'll see here there's one chimpanzee, a clever chimpanzee, works out you could do it the other way without having watched. And that is the stab way, which we might think actually is, is a very chimpy way, way, way to do this, a very, something that goes with the grain of being a chimpanzee, to use a stick and stick it in a hole. Uh, so we might think that if we run the whole series across these three groups, they'd all end up doing it the same way, stabbing. But that was not the case. If we run the whole sequence, to the contrary, in fact, we find that here, all of this group are doing it the way we seeded here at the start, and which was, in fact, the most common behavior all along. Um, and despite occasional uh, discoveries that there's another way to do it, they all stuck to what became the local tradition and sped right across these groups, suggesting that chimpanzees do have that capacity then in the wild. And just to underline this, here's those same data shown in a different way. Each of those little blocks is a chimpanzee, color-coded. Um, and we did it with another task as well, even a more complicated task I don't have time to explain. We call the turnip. And you can see from the color coding, again, the blue on the left, the green on the right, that again, we get the same uh, kind of effect. We even did it then with other groups elsewhere at the Yerkes Primate Center. Here are the panpipe results that, um, from that panpipe I showed you, all one group having seeded the poke technique, that's what they do. Whereas seeding the lift technique, that's what spreads across the other group. Although, again, here you have a few corruptions of chimpanzees finding you can use the poke technique instead. Here we've got hand clasp grooming. This wasn't part of the experiment, um, but we 
over the years, chimpanzees here invented this, and then it spread across the group. And what it is is this particular way of grooming, which is rather odd, where they, they join hands above like this and then groom underneath. And interestingly, in the wild, that's found in the Mahali Mountains in Tanzania, and not a couple of hundred miles away at Jane Goodall site, Gombe. Over 20, 30, 40 years, that difference has been maintained. And here it just resurfaced and spread differentially um, in the two groups. It's not just chimpanzees that we've shown this kind of effect in. So here's another example from another species. This is capuchin monkeys doing a much simpler thing. On the left here, just raising up a little door to get some food behind it. On the right, sliding uh, the same hatch to a different side to get the food behind that. So again, the same idea. We just show one capuchin how to do that. Um, and then we reunite them with the rest of their group. And here's what happens even on the first day. The behaviors spread differently. You've got a little group doing one thing and another group doing the alternative behavior. And if you run the whole sequence for a week, it gradually spreads further and further across the group. So these are quite dramatic demonstrations of the, not only social learning, but the diffusion of behaviors uh, to form little uh, traditions, even over quite short periods. So the next question then is on my list was, um, what about the, the, the mechanisms, the processes whereby these are spread? How is culture transmitted? Um, and this is actually quite a complex story. It's a very complex story. In fact, I'm just going to just flash up the next slide just to underline that and illustrate that, that some of the different ways in which we've dissected what can go on here, that, that a chimpanzee like this at the bottom there is actually taking in and picking up from what it sees. It, it's, it's all that horrible stuff, and this isn't the time of the evening to really delve into all of that. So as... Um, trying to express the essence of um, some of the differences there, <clears throat> we have in the middle the approach of imitation. So if we took that pan pipes I showed you there, imitation will be copying the action of, of lifting. Okay, But a simpler thing, the one at the top there called enhancement, sometimes called stimulus enhancement, is a, an animal might just have noticed that there's something interesting going on in a particular part of this, and then by trial and error or some other kind of independent learning, it works out what to do. But it's unlikely to match what happened in the same fidelity as if it's actually imitating or copying the action. But then the third category here is really quite interesting. It's been called emulation. And instead of learning from what the other individual does, what you're really getting to understand is how a part of the world works, how that panpipe thing works. So, for example, you're working out that, well, when the blockage goes up, uh, the grape rolls out, and, and uh, that, that, that chimpanzee is getting the grape. So maybe I can recreate that by my own uh, cleverness or trial and error, and eventually work out you, you can raise the blockage up in, in that way. Well, it looked like imitation, but in fact, it, it's just emulation. And a lot of evidence has suggested that, in fact, that's really what chimpanzees are doing. They may appear to be imitating, aping, <laughs> in, in uh, everyday language, but in fact, they're really working out how the world works and then <clears throat> reinventing that themselves, which is a quite a clever approach. So that's a big question in my area of research. I don't think the answer is that they are just emulators, even chimpanzees. Um, and we've, I'll show you two or three ways in which we've approached this. One is what's called the ghost experiment. And it's called that because we take a chimpanzee model out of the situation and all the events happen as if a ghost is actually making them happen. Well, someone, uh, an individual who's capable of emulative learning, just working out the way something works and then doing it, should be able to benefit from that. And the way we did this then was to not have a chimpanzee do these behaviors, make the blockage come up, we actually had a piece of fishing line, maybe you can just see it faintly there, which was used to raise the blockage up and down, up and down. And every time it went up, a grape came out, and sometimes the chimpanzee got one of those. So if a chimpanzee can learn by emulation rather than imitation, it should have benefited from that. And then we did another version of that over here, where we put the stick uh, actually in the blockage. It was kind of glued there and raised up by the fishing line. And to a human, if you see that, you think, well, that, that really gives the game away. That's almost like someone doing it. I would learn from that, I would think. But in fact, we found that chimpanzees didn't learn from either of these. these. This was really hopeless. If they saw these, they didn't get it. Whereas, as you've seen from my previous experiments, if they see a chimpanzee do it, they do get it so well that it will spread right across a group and from group to group, even. So a big contrast here. So we're rather down on the idea that chimpanzees are simply um, emulators who understand uh, the world. I think there's evidence that they do copy. And the little video I showed you of the young chimp, Baluku, 
doing the actions it was seeing um, of the expert nutcracker, I think, are also sort of consistent with that idea that there's a kind of imitative propensity in there. However, we did find that if we showed them a simpler task, like I showed you with the capuchins, where it's just opening a door or, in fact, pushing a door to one side or the other side, chimpanzees would learn about that just seeing that happen and then recreate that when it's their go. Um, but not to such an extent as if they watch a chimpanzee do it. That's to say, if they see it just happen magically, as it were, as if a ghost is doing it, they'll do it that way to begin with, and then they'll explore, well, maybe you can push it this way or that way and do it in different ways. Whereas if they watch a chimpanzee do it, they stick to doing it the same way their fellow, um, the, the conspecific member of their species does. Okay. But... I think what chimpanzees have, in fact, our research has shown, is actually much more like a kind of portfolio of different kind of social learning processes. They can apply in different contexts. So it's more than, rather than there being a simple dichotomy of imitation or emulation, there's something more like a, a continuum. And that's what I think we see here in this experiment, which was called uh, or referred to as imitation emulation switching. We did this with chimpanzees and with young children, as we do a lot of our, our research. So here's a young chimpanzee, again, on that Angamba Island uh, doing this. And what the chimpanzee sees to begin with is this opaque or black box here, uh, in which a familiar caretaker takes a tool, gets rid of some kind of defenses on the top here, and then stabs the stick in several times, as you'll see in a video in a moment. And then when that's happened, they pull the stick out, and they get rid of another defense here, and then they stick the stick in and pull out some food and share that with the chimpanzee. So imagine you're a young chimpanzee, you've seen all that, well, what would you do? Now it's your turn. Presumably, we were hypothesizing you'd do all that. You've seen that's what works. That's the technique. Try and copy it. However, you might be in a different experiment or a different condition of the same experiment where it's the same box, except it's completely transparent. And when you get the transparent version, you can see that when that stick goes in the top here, it actually just beats on a little partition here. So we've designed this so that part of the, what you see, in fact, isn't actually necessary. In the transparent version, you can see that. So we predict in that situation, if what we're looking at is an intelligent imitator, as so an intelligent copier, they'll miss that bit out. So if you're in this condition, you'll start at the top and do all that. If you're in this condition, you'll miss that out intelligently and just go for the bottom here, a more emulative approach rather than a completely faithful imitation with the black box. Well, what you're going to see now, again, is another video clip from a TV program. Um, which uh, I think, yes, <coughs> shows uh, Vicky Horner arriving at Angamba Island. So there's a certain sort of scenic aspect to this, but I thought it, it's good to show you the flavor of what this, this research is actually like. Here's Vicky, here's the black box, uh, the opaque box that she's taking, and she's actually going to, first of all, present this to young children, uh, Ugandan children, and then we're going to see it with chimpanzees. The research originally Oh, okay, let's hear what she has to say. Actually seeing, learning, and action. As chimpanzees have only been studied scientifically in the last about 40 years. She uses two box apps to test whether the way we learn can explain our success. We present both chimpanzees and children with this box. This is a, a black box. And it's completely opaque. You can't see the inside of the box, you can't see how it works at all. And inside this, there is a food reward for chimpanzees, or for human children, there's a little sticker. Paula demonstrates the long sequence of action Jessica must use to get the reward. <coughs> you notice this really isn't necessary at all. It's just a little ritual. You notice that she's even doing that little ritual at the beginning. So it's a very faithful copy that you're going to see here. She successfully picks up the complicated sequence of actions and gets her reward. Next, Paula and 
There's the transparent box on the other side, you can see. This tropical paradise is a sanctuary for rescue chimpanzees. It's four years since Paul was last here, and Billy, a female chimpanzee, greets her like a long lost friend. You have to trust them when to do that. It's time for the experiment. Paula demonstrates the movements to Billy. Now it's Billy's turn. Will she copy the action? This little part of what you're seeing, I think, is a quite good illustration of the idea that chimpanzees are more emulators, more likely to emulate in the sense that she's understood how the thing works. That thing has to come out there, but she's not using the tool the way the, act the model did. But now she is. Now she's actually copying, imitating the actual uh, action pattern. And now she'll get the food out. Yeah, but not just like as Jessica. This experiment is not about how apes learn, it's about understanding how humans learn. That's not actually true. You have to be quite thick skinned if you work with the TV people, but <clears throat> of course it's comparative. But now this is just to show the transparent box. Clear box as we might call it. Clear box. And this one is structurally identical to the black box, but this time all of the, the walls of the box are made of see-through material. And actually, there's a full ceiling which runs right around the top here, so that all the actions to the top are irrelevant. They're pretend nonsense actions. And the sticker for the food award is actually located in this tube at the front. Jessica can now see that poking the stick in the top is pointless. Well, that's the question, can she? Um, <clears throat> uh, because what we, um, it's, uh, we... We don't have time to watch the whole video, sadly. So let's switch to a bit more sort of no normal scientific uh, illustration. We have a graph. Um, this is showing what we predicted uh, would happen with the, with the children. So they get three goes with the opaque box, and we predict here, that, with the yellow lines here, that they'll do the irrelevant action in the top. Okay? But then when they switch, when they first get the clear box, they'll do something different. They'll only go for the relevant action beneath. They'll miss out that irrelevant action. So that's what we predict. What do we find with children? That. So this is science in action. Okay, you make your hypothesis, you do the experiment, and your hypothesis goes right out the window. Uh, that's science. Um, but it was fascinating, and uh, we were really quite boggled, because you look at these children, and you think, this, this, uh, this is the intelligent species, right, we're looking at. And uh, they're just copying the whole lot. Um, uh, and, and it's not just because they get the habit of doing the opaque one and then they transfer that to the clear one. If we start with the clear one, they still pretty much copy everything. So this was a real surprise to us. The idea is we look at our own species, they'll give us the baseline, they'll, they'll imitate in one way, they'll emulate in the other, they're the intelligent. And then does the chimpanzee behave the same? But in fact, the children <laughs> behave like this. What about the chimpanzees? Well, the chimpanzees did do what we predicted, an intelligent imitator would do. They didn't copy so much to begin with, and you saw that, in fact. You saw Billy there. She, she didn't copy the, some of the, the detail there. Uh, but she did go in the top, uh, which is what most, most of them um, do, but then stop, largely stop doing that once they can see, no, that, that's not necessary. So things were really, if you might say, the reverse of what, what we were expecting. And the research on children has led to a whole sort of minor industry in developmental psychology. They've even got a name for it, over-imitation. You can see why it's called that, over-imitation. Um, trying to understand what, what's going on here. Um, well, what is going on there? Why is this difference thinking about our own species? Well, perhaps it's because we are so cultural. It's so important to learn everything from uh, the adult world in particular around. It's a good rule of thumb, perhaps, to copy everything you see 
faithfully, don't think too much about it, if you like, relatively mindlessly copy. Um, that, that's one interpretation of this. And this leads me on to another topic, which uh, is referred to as conformity, which again, perhaps is a rule of thumb. I always introduce it with this slide nowadays, which when first sight looks like a herd of sheep, right? A flock of sheep, a sort of um, ultimate conformers. If you're a member of a flock of sheep, you do what all the other sheep do. But of course, this is human beings. Um, this is actually, I think, one of those works of art, um, sadly, but it, 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 it illustrates the idea, I think, we can all think of human activities where we are incredibly conformist. We do what we do because everybody else in, in our community is doing that. So that's what you do. That's conformity. And it's a kind of uh, rule of thumb. And we've investigated this in various species, but um, I'm going to tell you one nice example I think we have from, not from chimpanzees, but from vervet monkeys, wild vervet monkeys living in South Africa. This is part of a collaboration with a big Swiss team. Erika van der Waal, the person named here, is the main postdoc working with me on this. And what we did was we exploited the fact that these vervets, every once in a while, were given a big box of free food, which allows us to sort out things like, well, who, what, what their ranks are and who, who's affiliated with whom. But for this experiment, we divided it into half, and half of it we dyed pink, and half of it blue. And one of those we made taste horrible by taking natural aloe and, and soaking the food in aloe overnight. It really does taste disgusting. So they very quickly then, just on three goes, to eat one or the other. So here's a group who you can see have learned to eat pink. Um, and uh, here's uh, another group like that. But here's a group who've learned to ignore the pink, even just sit on it, to eat the blue. That's what they do. So what we did in this experiment was um, <coughs> Do this operation with four groups. We had two who learned you eat blue, you ignore the pink, and two the other way around. We had over 100 uh, monkeys that Erica magically can recognize all of them. Um, and he was the form of the experiment. So they get three goes to begin with where they learn that rule locally. We're doing that at a stage when the infants are very small, so small that they're not taking solid food. They don't learn anything at this stage, just the adults learn it. And then, four months later, we bring these foods back and we present them, but now without anything nasty in them, at a stage when the infants have uh, re reached a point where they're going to take solid food. So we're interested in what they will do. They're presented with these two colors of food, both of which are perfectly edible. Do they learn in, by individually which is best? Or are they influenced, and how much are they influenced socially by what everybody else around them is doing and just eating one of those? Well, the answer is, it's very strong social effect. We had 27 infants, and 26 of them, the only thing they first ate was what their group were eating. So they'd ignore the other one, even though, remember, it's perfectly edible. We just have one infant who didn't. And that's the infant who, there's always one, um, who, but who actually proved the rule, because his mother was very low ranking, and she just crept in and just took a bit of food, which is the wrong food as well, the nasty tasting food, and she tried it. And now, of course, it's okay. So she ate it, and her infant ate what she ate. So actually, 27 infants, I can draw the graph in a different way, 27 infants out of 27 ate just what their mother ate. So very strong um, vertical social learning. That's to say, vertical learning it from the past generation. But what was really exciting in this result, how we get onto conformity, is what we might call horizontal social learning in the same generation, because males in this species always migrate when they mature. There's a season of the year when they migrate, and they're looking for females to mate with in different groups. This avoids inbreeding. And it just so happened that five monkeys came in who we didn't know, so that isn't the interesting thing here. What was really interesting is that some of our monkeys moved from group to group, and we knew both groups, and they swapped from places where everybody ate blue to everybody eats pink, or the other way around. So now, imagine you're one of these monkeys. You've lived somewhere where everyone eats pink. Blue's horrible, so you won't never eat that. You go to somewhere else, everyone's eating blue. What do you do? So I just want to sort of try, try out on you. I've never done this before. Just see what you think. I'm going to give you three choices. You imagine you're one of these males, OK? Um, and you go to this other place, and everyone's eating the thing that normally back home everybody avoids. What would you do? Would you stick to what you know? That's the first option, because you know, that's what you've learned. Or would you see everybody's doing something else and immediately start eating that? 
Or would you go for a third option where you, well, you start eating what you know, but then gradually you'll notice that others are eating something, and so you try that. So let me just see, because I can have a show of hands. I'm just interested to know what, what people think. How many of you, if you were this male, would, would you stick to what you know? Yes, okay, we've got a few uh, conservatives here, maybe with small C's, um, or not. <laughs> um, okay, how many, how many would see that they're eating something else and switch, switch to that straight away? Okay, oh, more to do that. What about the, uh, if you like, the intermediate step of, uh, okay, so that's what, and that's what we would have thought actually probably, um, that kind of intermediate compromise, <laughs> slightly cautious, but then, oh, I see. But in fact, it was the people who put their hands up second. The monkeys immediately switched, to our surprise. So here's what those males were eating in the two, two different places they'd come from color-wise. What did they do when they first had a go? Many of them started to switch. But what's crucial here is what happened as soon as they were in a situation where they weren't outranked, because they knew male, new individuals coming into a group that they're having to sort out their dominance relations. Um, but when the high-ranking ones could clear when they could choose what they really wanted to eat, they wanted to eat what was the local color. So it seems really, when in Rome, do as the Romans do if, if you're a vervet monkey, which is conformity. Okay, so I think um, that's the point at which I've talked a lot about what the similarities are, I guess, as well as some of the differences between uh, what we might call culture in our own species and what we see in others. So there is a big question about, well, what, what really is the difference then? And many researchers in this area would point to one particular thing, that we are the species whose culture is cumulative. Our cultures build in a rather special way on what went before. And you and I, I think all of us here, have, have lived through seeing that happen, say, in terms of digital technology. In our lifetimes, that aspect of our culture has built cumulatively on, on what people had invented before. So we saw the first computers probably in many of our lifetimes. Now we have digital projectors like this and so on. This example here is, in a sense, the better example, at least it's the longest term example, two and a half million years of cumulative evolution of the axe or, or hammer from the first uh, stone axes, then hafting them at a certain stage, and then becoming more and more sophisticated. There were over 500 kinds of hammer in Birmingham um, at the height of the Industrial Revolution. And then here uh, we've got a, finally a, a steam hammer. So that's what our species is capable of. And you know, everything you see in, in here, pretty much of our material culture, is a result of that kind of process. And it has been said that that actually completely separates us. That's the key to the rest of the animal kingdom. I don't think it's that simple, and I'm going to suggest an example now, um, because <clears throat> it's not as always impressive as what we do, but in, in chimpanzees, here's a case which is perhaps our best candidate for there being some kind of accumulation. You've probably seen on TV chimpanzees take a, a little uh, stem and use that to fish in a termite mound and get termites out. That's quite common across Africa but not universal. There are traditional differences in that. But here you're getting something even more special. These chimpanzees have come on to, well, you'll see, they're coming into a clearing. They've brought the fishing tools they're going to use, so they've harvested those on the way and have got ready. They know what they're going to do. But when they get to the site, it's a two-stage process because they're first of all going to take a stout stick that's often left there, and they're going to push that down and make a tunnel down to subterranean termites, sometimes that deep. And having made that tunnel, pull out the stick and then use uh, the other one. And what the researchers are saying, you know, it's, it's un unimaginable that they've just invented that in the present generation. It's even miraculous to think, well, how did it come about? It must have been a long, drawn-out process. So let's watch uh, another little video clip now to illustrate this. I think this is fantastic. So here they are. They brought these tools to the site. Picking up one of the thick tools here, and he's going to start now. He knows what to do. He's cleaning it off, making a little indentation, and going to press it down to make a hole. Most of that stick's going to go down, and you can see the strength that's being exerted on it. He clearly knows what he's doing. Bit of excited greeting there. This always reminds me of Mr. McGregor digging his garden, you know, with his, uh, with his spade. Several of the chimpers, now some females coming in and joining in.
And when the tunnel's made, it's nearly finished making the tunnel now, it's going to sit down and fashion the fishing tool, which you won't be able to see too well. But he's going to strip it through his mouth. You can see this? And what he's doing is making a brush tip on one end so that when he inserts it very carefully down the tunnel, the termites bite on it and it's a more efficient fishing tool. So this is really quite elaborate um, and, and difficult to imagine that it, it's uh, a, 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 anything other than cumulative to a degree. But of course, you know, if, if, if we compare that to our examples, uh, our human examples, the, the stone tools there, this tree here is just the evolutionary tree of the Indo-European languages. Here, another aspect of cumulative culture, the evolution of language. Again, as for the chimpanzee example, we can't see the past of that, but we know it just didn't uh, appear overnight and, of course, continues to uh, evolve. So, I think there are some similarities, and again, it, it points to uh, the likelihood that even something as special as our cumulative culture didn't just come out of the blue, but built on, on certain foundations. But nevertheless, we are, as it were, the pinnacle of culture in that respect. And here, to finish with, is a, a quick sort of summary diagram that Carol van Schaik uh, and I have concocted. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but I think it's a good summary of what we think has happened uh, in the evolution of the, this uh, second inheritance system I'm talking about. Because first of all, at the base, we've got what we call social information transfer, that's including social learning, all that's acquired by observing and taking other information from others. We've seen an example of that in the vervet monkeys, what the young learn from their parents, for example. But here in the bottom right is a different infant, a cub learning from a wolf mother, sniffing her, her breath. And it's that kind of olfactory information transfer has been shown to shape the diet. So that's another form of social information transfer. And that kind of um, transmission has been shown not only in mammals, but birds, fish, um, all kinds of vertebrates and invertebrates. So here's an example, or bees are here, because it's been shown in experiments that Bees will learn from observing other bees which flowers are the hot flowers to go to today. This, these are the good flowers. Um, and that's a kind of social information transfer. So this is really very widespread in the animal kingdom. But a lot of those uh, effects are really quite transient. They're short term. So what's a good flower today perhaps isn't in a few days, days time. For a group of monkeys, you can learn to follow the others and that's a good fruiting tree, but again, it won't be in a short period of time. It's only when these effects become long term by being transmitted to others and, and spreading across a whole group and having some duration that we can call it a tradition. And that's a smaller block in the, in the pyramid that's built on this, this more widespread um, phenomenon of social information transfer. Um, here's just another example of that, which allows me to uh, introduce another form of learning. I've talked about imitation and other forms of observational social learning, but teaching. Meerkats, uh, one of the things they, they have to eat in the Kalahari is um, scorpions. And that's a dangerous thing to have to learn about if you're a young kid like this. And what the parents do, however, is a whole sequence of behavior that has been described as teaching. Not that they necessarily know their teaching or understand what teaching is. But they do start out bringing scorpions, first of all, dead scorpions. And then they'll bring scorpions that are alive, but they've taken the, the sting off. So it's okay for the kid to learn about, for the cub to learn about. And then as they get more competent, they'll leave the sting on. And they'll go and recover the, the scorpion if it gets away and generally hang around, kind of like a helicopter kind of parent, just... Um, ensuring that the, 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 the offspring has the opportunity to, to learn. So a different kind of, of social information transfer, producing this tradition of, of you know, how to eat uh, scorpions in this case, as well as other behavior. But then Van Schaik and I just, just defined culture as being one step above just the existence of a tradition, but having multiple traditions, a real kind of richness of traditions. And I've illustrated that mainly today by our own work on chimpanzees, but we see the same kind of pattern, almost as complicated as that in another great ape that's been well studied by Carol Van Schaik, the orangutan, surprising me, perhaps, because they, they tend to be much more solitary. And uh, another example of that um, comes from cetaceans, whales, dolphins. Uh, in this case, a study that was published last year by my colleagues Luke Rendell and, and Jenny Allen on humpback whales, you've probably seen them on TV where they, they 
<coughs> surround with a bubble net uh, a, a, a large uh, shoal of fish, and then they come up and with that huge mouth grab that shoal of fish. But about 23 years ago, someone first observed a female doing this behavior, which is called lobtail feeding, where she smacks the surface of the water. That makes the, the shoal kind of cringe like this into a, a better ball and can be more easily harvested. And over, I think it's over 70,000 observations over the 20 years, 23 years since, that's been observed to gradually spread. And there was an amazing diagram accompanying this paper in Science last year alongside our vervet study. Uh, this is a social network that's been, been shown of hundreds of these whales. And the blue dots in the middle are the ones who are best connected to others in the social network. And they're the ones who've picked up this behavior uh, as opposed to the red ones. So that's humpback whales, but it's not only this kind of behavior they do. Their vocal behavior has been shown to spread as well. Extraordinarily, particular uh, songs that they sing have spread right across the ocean, and it's been, been tracked over a period of years. And then another one will start and, and spread. So you can actually track that diffusion uh, over the real time of, of a study. So they fit that category as well. And then finally, of course, we get then cumulative culture. So that brings me to the end of my talk, um, which I'll, I'll conclude by saying, why is all this important? What, what, what's important in what we've achieved here? And I think two things, uh, or at least two, two I'm going to use as a summary. One is looking towards biology and the life sciences. This is a medal for the life sciences. So I think the important thing there is this notion of a second inheritance system. We've known for long that individuals can adapt to uh, their environment through a process of evolution of uh, behavior by natural selection, acting on, as it were, the genetic system and also by individual learning. But this social learning system, as it were, is another form of, of inheritance which can be really quite powerful because you can learn so much by what everybody else has learned that you can capitalize on. So that in a nutshell I think is, is the significance of all this work um, at the theory level uh, for the life sciences. The other implication, of course, is looking towards ourselves. We are inherently um, anthropocentric uh, creatures who want to know, well, what about our own culture? Where did that come from? And I think the whole of this story shows that our culture isn't completely separate. It is distinct in, in various ways that I've underlined, and I think that's also highlighted by, by what I've talked about. But it didn't completely come out of the blue, I think, is the story here. There are these foundations of really complex cultures shared with our closest living relatives and some other large brain, very social species like the cetaceans. But then as we go back, um, as it were, to, to broader uh, aspects of, of the basis of this um, pyramid, we can see foundations that are really very widespread in the animal kingdom. So um, that's where I'll finish, except for just two more slides. Um, one is an advert. Um, it's, uh, this year, it's the BBSRC, the Biological uh, Funding Council. Um, it's their 20th anniversary, and they're celebrating throughout the whole year in a way that culminates in November um, with the Great British Science Festival. It's going to be a big exhibition over several days in London in mid-November. And um, we're fortunately one of the exhibits that have been selected to be in that. And surprise, surprise, our exhibit's called Animal Cultures. So if you want to attend that, you can go to London. However, they're very keen we show this regionally. And we're going to have it in Edinburgh Zoo, if we can get it ready on time. I think, I think we will. I think we will. Um, for the first weekend in August and the second weekend in August and the week in between. So that will be in the Dongo Lecture Theatre in Edinburgh Zoo. You're very welcome to come along and see that. My, myself and various colleagues working on these other species as well, like the whales and others I haven't talked about, like New Caledonian crows and the way they use their clever tools. Um, okay, and the final slide is to really say thanks to all my colleagues, my collaborators, my co-authors who've made all this research possible and who share, as it were, a bit, a bit of this medal. Um, so thanks to them and all our sponsors. Um, and there's a lot of them uh, to whom I owe that gratitude. Thank you. Can I just allow myself one comment before I conduct this um, question and answer session? What a tour de force of two things. 
science and communication. I thought that was just wonderful. And I speak as someone whose field of expertise, such as it is, could not be further from Andrews. I thought that was just wonderful. We've now got about 15, 20 minutes for a question and answer session. Could you um, keep your questions pithy and to the point uh, so that Andrew can give the fullest possible answers in the time that we've got? Who would like to start? Gentleman just there, and then I think my hand just in that corner, did I? And then we'll go You showed us experiments with the clear box and the uh, blacked out black box. Yes. On the child and then on the um, chimpanzee. Chimpanzee, yes. But what I'm wondering is what did you tell the child was the object of the exercise? Yes. And doesn't that make it a different situation from that of the chimpanzee? If the child had, depending on how much the child was told, it might have not seemed to be the thing to do to miss out the irrelevant steps. Yes, good, very good point, yeah. And of course, you know, I don't have time to get, give all, all the detail here. Um, and in fact, there's quite a lot of uh, interesting research in this area suggesting that young children are indeed very sensitive to picking up signs uh, of what's been called a kind of pedagogical intent um, in their parents that certain, certain behavior that is done is done for them to copy. So in this experiment, um, we were very careful not to, to do the opposite of as a way of saying, now it's your turn, uh, can you do what I've done, or anything like that. There's, there's nothing there that would indicate to them they should copy. What they see is someone doing it, and then it's, now it's your turn. However, uh, let me, I'd just like to use that to go on and, and just mention uh, some other experiments that have followed from this, because what you saw there was just uh, what you would have seen in the original experiments. It was three and four-year-old children. And as I say, when we first saw them, we were quite boggled, thinking, goodness, uh, in a sense, God, how stupid are little children like that? Uh, you know, when will they grow out of it? So we then tested five-year-olds and found that they did it even more. And then someone started testing some other children uh, who were even older into their teens and found they seemed to do it just as much or more. So we thought, okay, uh, and Nicola McGigan, I think, is in the room somewhere, I thought, uh, yeah, hi, uh, who did, did this research with me. We'll do it with adults. Um, and so we did it with adults, and we got the same effect. In fact, we got a stronger effect with adults. And there we began to worry, and if you're an adult, imagine coming into a, a laboratory, as it were, you know, and you, you're doing this experiment, someone does something with this. You're not told what to do, but then it's your turn. You might think, well, probably I'm supposed to do this. So the further thing we've done, and we've not published this, so... Dangerous. This is being recorded, isn't it? I'll, I'll take the risk um, before we've published it. So what we've done is uh, we have a primate centre in Edinburgh Zoo. Some of you may know that, living, the Living Link Centre. It's a primate centre, but the public are encouraged to, to wander through it. And in the middle of it, we have a science exploration zone where the various things, like this, pan pipes, that you can have a go at. And so we put the transparent box in the middle of this. And the students doing the project would uh, be dressed as kind of visitors. And so they'd watch someone coming along the road, and then they'd go in and do all this stuff with a transparent box. Then they'd go off here and they'd get their clipboard, and then you know, they'd watch what this person did. And then after that, they would then approach them and say, well, I've, I've noted what you've done. I've not written it down, but you know, can I have your permission to do it? And everyone says, yes, of course. But what they found was that, again, adults really copied all of this. So I've had to shift myself from, and so people don't know, you certainly don't know they're in that experiment, and these are adults. Um, so I've had to shift from this position of thinking, how stupid is that, to thinking, well, I suppose that's what perhaps I would do. And that, that leads on to various interesting thoughts about you know, what's actually happening here. We, should, but, we perhaps shouldn't belabor it and probably give someone a... But didn't a, anyone a, ask you? In, in that, sorry. Didn't what, any of the adults say? Uh, all right, it's my turn, but what's the object? Well, they could see what the object was of, you know, what the, the person before, what the student had been getting, getting out of it. So, you know, that's what they wanted to recreate, it, it seems. Yeah. Thank you. Gentleman, right at the back, in the middle, please. Hi. Um, I think uh, my question is basically, um, in the last uh, 20 or so years in science, there's been... A, a, an emphasis on the gene and uh, that all information is passed uh, through on the gene and everything the animal needs to do whatever it needs is transmitted via genes and so on, um, which 
I think has uh, sort of made it okay for, we sort of have the idea that um, it's okay for an animal population to go extinct in the wild um, as long as we still have a population in a zoo that, or, you know, uh, and we can have a breeding program and reintroduce them at some point. But what I, my question to you is that uh, I wonder if, uh, seeing as you talking about the importance of cultural learning in animals, um, whether as this, your research progresses, whether um, that will change the emphasis of conservation to preserving natural habitats rather than preserving populations in, in captivity? Um, I mean, the short answer to that is, is yes. Um, so I think one of the tragedies of, of uh, not only our research, but in a sense all research on just to take the one species, chimpanzees, who are, who are threatened and, and endangered, is that, as I say, 50 years ago we knew nothing about them. Now we know a lot, but that's just a 50-year window and now we've opened that window, it's closing because the species is being extinguished by our species. Um, and it's worse than that. I think that's what this research is showing. It's worth, we're not just losing chimpanzees. All the while, we're use, losing different chimpanzee cultures in different parts of Africa. It's a bit kind of analogous, I suppose, to the human case of using different, losing different language groups in, in New Guinea or South, Af South America, where there are all these different language groups, and we're losing those. It, it's a parallel to that. So one is just the tragedy, but you know, your, your question was, well, what could it lead to? In fact, it already has led to, uh, there's a project run by the New York, no, not the New York Zoological Society, the Smithsonian, the, the Washington Na National Zoo, uh, with golden lion tamarins, trying to reintroduce them to the wild, which, which is done with some species, and you know, if there's habitat, you can at least have a go at that. I mean, the problem always with that, of course, is the habitat's going as well, so it, it, it's problematic. But if you can do it, what they found was consistent with what we're showing is here, that the golden lions were released and so on, and it, it was disastrous, because they didn't know, what, you know what, what to do. So it's moved to a stage of actually getting some individuals there who do know, a bit like you know, our chimpanzees, we train to be experts who, who do know about how to handle local foods and so on, and, and keeping these in, enclosures next to the, the naive ones, so that the naive ones gradually learn from the experts. They're apprenticed, if you like. So I think that's perhaps an answer to your question. Gentleman there, and then the gentleman there. Some of the things you said reminded me of first year prehistoric archaeology, which I'm afraid is half a century away, but one of the essential reading books was called Man the Toolmaker. <laughs> mm. Forget the author, might have been Ian Cornwall. Was it Oakley? Might have oh, been. Anyway, okay. I think it was Oakley, yes. Mm. And we knew, of course, that other animals, and not just higher primates, use tools, but the distinction of man the toolmaker, now even in those days, there were the beginnings of thoughts that other higher primates do fashion objects into tools. And the lecturer got around that by saying, ah, yes, but they only do it in response to an immediate visual invitation of a reward. Only Homo sapiens does it as a conceptual operation for future use. Now, you demonstrated tonight with that interesting video clip, chimpanzees on their way to the termite mound had acquired their tools. So would you say examples like that mean that this distinction between Homo sapiens and the rest of the higher primates is no longer valid? Um, well, I mean, you're right. The, 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 this research is showing the chimpanzees are sort of anticipating a, a goal and preparing for it as they go. They're not necessarily fashioning the tools until they get there, actually, and, and manipulating them. Um, so, yes, but, it, but at the same time, there, there is a huge gulf I think, um, between ourselves um, and them. And one of those uh, main distinctions, I think, is still that they tend to fashion tools by destruction. So they will take um, a, a piece of leafy branch and they'll, they'll gradually take, take bits off until they've got the right tool. Um, a crucial part of human technological evolution was the bit shown in the, in the evolution of uh, the hammer when there was hafted onto uh, a, a handle. So c um, creating tools or building tools constructively I think is, is still very much a province for us. We've, we've pushed that a bit to see, well, could chimpanzees learn that? Um, and we found that they can. So there's a capacity there. That's to say, we did an experiment in which chimpanzees saw a model, take some sticks with fit together to make a longer tool. So they had a longer rake and they, they could rake tool, uh, food towards them. And several of them learned that. 
One or two of them were clever enough to work out, in fact, half a dozen of the large group were uh, clever enough to work it out just by trial and error. I mean, they tried everything. But it was certainly um, most of them learned socially. Um, one thing I'm, I can't resist adding to that uh, description of that experiment is rather lovely. It fits in with what I was talking about, um, uh, about potency of social learning that, that can be there. Because the, the student who was doing that work, Bess Price, who, who's now a lecturer at Newcastle, um, then went on to uh, present the food closer to the chimpanzee. And again, it was this kind of pushing, well, how clever is this imitator and how mindless at the other extreme is it? Um, and so sometimes the food was so close that so we didn't need to stick the sticks together. And what she found is that the, the chimpanzees who'd worked it out for themselves that you could do this, they st abandoned that and, and started just using the stick. Or some of it was so close you could get it with your fingers. But the ones who'd learned it socially kept putting together this stick and then very awkwardly <laughs> trying to use this long, long stick. And again, well, you can maybe imagine some people who, who might do that as well. But it's, um, it, it, it's that potency of social learning that, that that illustrates on top of this, I think. So I've wandered off from your question, but um, OK. Just one, then just there. Yeah. You, you, you've shown us many uh, examples of uh, chimpanzees learning in various ways. Yeah. You showed us also um, meerkats seem to be teaching mm. uh, their, yeah, their in young. In a kind of functional way, I think. That's yes. right. Mm. Um, I think Homo, sap well, Homo, sapien, Homo sapiens are so successful, not only do we learn, but we also teach. So have you seen any examples that you could positively say in the chimpanzee community where a, an adult is actually actively teaching? OK. Um, there have been a few anecdotal reports of, of that. Um, so to, if I can remember one of them, uh, it's, it's the nutcracking context, interestingly, which is the most challenging thing any wild chimpanzee does. And I say it could take years to master it. But a chimpanzee, young chimpanzee, I forget how old they were, probably three or something like that, was, was hammering away and making a real hash of it, a mess of it. And its mother came over, took the tool from it, slowly turned it round in her hand to the right way, cracked a nut, and then put it down there. And the, that the youngster came over, picked it up, and got it right. However, there's about, you know, you can count these episodes on the fingers of, of one hand. Um, and so um, it, it's very different from a community that, you know, habitually teaches. And I think, think we have to be quite skeptical of, of, you know, just a handful of anecdotes uh, like that. So actually, the broad picture is one of not teaching in not only in apes, but I think non-human primates, where you get the kind of teaching, it's just functional teaching, I think, rather than intentional teaching, perhaps. It, like in the meerkat, seems to be uh, predatory animals. Because if you think uh, for a predatory animal like a meerkat or, say, a cheetah, you know, who has to go from just suckling from your mother to catching an antelope, it's a huge leap. Um, and perhaps it needs that kind of support and scaffolding of the teaching for some parent to, to bring you something to practice with and disable it to begin with and then gradually let it be more, more of a challenge to you. Whereas primates, even like chimpanzees, perhaps don't have that pressure. They've got several years. They're very slow growing. And so they've got several years to watch what the adults do, try and do it, and it can take, as I say, year. they've got months and years to master even something like uh, the nutcracking. Um, however, we tend to think we're, we're teachers, we're the teaching species, and you know, I am my living teaching, I suppose, so that all the professors and, and uh, lecturers here think, yes, teaching is really important, however, in our species. But when people have looked at hunter-gatherer people, people living just off the wild, wild um, plants, wild animals is what they're harvesting, There's, anthropologists have reported rather little record of Teach, explicit teaching, saying, well, here's how you do this. It's much more observational learning of the kind we've seen in the chimpanzees. And of course, everything does happen, as it were, in full view. And given that kind of way of life, I think, is characterized, you might say, 99 plus percent of, of human history. We only sort of shifted to agriculture 10,000 10, years ago or so. It may be that teaching hasn't been that common or special, even, even in our species. Yeah, so that, that's part of you know, the, the other side of the comparison. I think we, take, we could take a couple more. <clears throat> Lady right in the middle there.
she thought it was time that they had learnt to do it themselves. And she would show, not feed the baby straight away, but would feed herself. And um, the baby still just sat there with its mouth wide open. And then she would rather crossly put something in it and then concentrate on herself. So that was a, that's a form of teaching, I think, isn't it? Um, is it from a teacher? Well, it's a, certainly, I think what you're looking at is, is uh, sort of an example of what's been called parent-offspring conflict, that the way natural selection <laughs> operates on infants and on their parents is, is inherently in conflict. That's to say, infants are designed to try and take more, more from the parent than it's probably in the parent's interest to give. So that, that conflict can often be there uh, in natural <laughs> relationships between, between infants and, and their parents. Uh, but the kind of structured withdrawal of that support... Um, uh, perhaps that could be thought of as a form of form of teaching. That's certainly what's happened, even in the elaborate forms of, of the meerkats. You know, to begin with, they make it easy, then they make it more challenging, and and often the pups would, as it were, <laughs> clearly prefer that things were easier. Uh, but the parents making it that much uh, more of a challenge as things go along. And I think that, that's what's interesting about this kind of teaching. It, it does sort of change as the infant um, develops. One very nice um, way in which I think, I think the evidence for teaching in those meerkats is really quite conclusive. It is again, it was assessed experimentally, and you can tell a bit, have a bit of a preference for starting with the wild observations, but then trying to do a, a, a neat experiment to show it. What they did was play back calls of meerkat pups of different ages, and by doing that, they were able to manipulate the behaviour of the parent. So the parent would be there, sort of bringing live prey to uh, the, the, the pup, and then they play the calls of a very young pup, and then the parent would then revert to treating them as, as kind of rather uh, even younger and more incompetent and, and start bringing um, prey with, with, the, with the sting taken off and so on. So you could sort of see how that sequence uh, develops. Yeah. Is there one more question? Yes, gentleman in the red jacket. barriers are removed, there's an accelerated change, rate of change and development among humans. Would you care to comment on that? And B, is there any evidence of that kind of accelerated change in some animal cultures? Okay, uh, I mean, I think you're right. Um, cumulative culture in humans seems to be sort of progressively accelerating, uh, you know, to most of us, I think, as we, we grow older to a frightening uh, degree, you know, thinking of this digital technology, you know, it's difficult to keep up. Um, so yes, and maybe that, that is, as it were, almost a characteristic of cumulative culture, that that, 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 that can and will happen, uh, certainly with a creature with you know, a brain as big as ours. And it's worth remembering, as we keep making these comparisons, our brain, we know, we're similar size to a chimpanzee, our brain is three times bigger. So no wonder, you know, there is a behavioral goal. On the other hand, a chimpanzee's brain is twice as big as an average uh, mammal of, of its size. So they're relatively bright as well. So I've lost my thread now. Um, so cumulative culture, yes. So uh, do we see anything like that in, in any other primates? And the answer is very little, um, I think, in the wild. But then maybe that's not so surprising because even if you took our species and you go back to two million years, between two million years and one million years ago, we're starting seeing the development of that, that, that uh, stone tool technology to beautiful Acheulean hand axes. You've probably seen the pear-shaped thing, and if you turn it sideways, it's really flat, and I, I, they're really difficult to make, believe me. Um, but that stayed the same for nearly a million years, and already then, you know, our ancestors' brain size had, had doubled, and we were making these complicated things that must have surely been passed on by some sort of sophisticated imitation process, at least. Um, uh, and yet... It, it didn't really uh, start, start to accelerate even then. So it, we may need to watch chimpanzees for 10,000 years before we'll see the next little step, you know. And we're not going to be around that long. <laughs> we're, do, we're doing some, some research at the moment where we're actually trying to speed things up a bit by creating another kind of experiment where we might be able to see, well, how far do chimpanzees go and compare them with, with children uh, ask, asking exactly the kind of question you're asking. That's one of our current lines of research. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew.